when they say, I don't have time or I can't afford it, those are the two common lies of the human condition. I don't have time and I can't afford it. So when I hear people say those things, I say, what if you just switch that to, do I value it enough? And if I do, what would it take to afford it? So one of the cool experiences I did with my kids is I donated a, a charitable thing and they let me go to um, Vancouver and drive from Vancouver to Whistler in this $750,000 Ferrari. So I brought the kids and, and like, I got to have these conversations with them because they're like, this is amazing. I want one of these. I'm like, cool. You could have one of these, but you know what it takes to actually add enough value in the world to get one of these things. I don't know if playing call of duty is going to get you there. I don't know if watching friends every night is going to make that happen for you. just want to teach my kids, you know, abundance, empower them. And so they're only three and one and a half right now. But I mean, just in little ways, I think we're already doing that. You know, these are the most important years. Um, so like my daughter wants toys all the time. She sees commercials all the time. Like even with food, I'm like, I don't want to tell them, you know, like, I just don't want to ever be like, there's not enough. Um, or, you know, you're lucky you have this, or, you know, I don't want to tell her, no, she can't have things because she doesn't understand money yet. So, I mean, you obviously have children. How, um, how do you handle teaching them abundance and not scarcity in the home? So the first thing, and sometimes my son rolls his eyes as I do this, but, uh, there's a thing called the five minute journal, um, that I like to do every day. Uh, where you write down three things you're grateful for, three intentions that you have for the day, and then acknowledging things about who you are. And then you review your day and say one of the things you'd like to work on or potentially improve. And so when I drive them somewhere, I like to say, what are you grateful for? Because I feel like gratitude is a fuel for abundance. Sure. And when we can start to be grateful for things, because society teaches us to complain about what we don't have or what we don't like, rather than acknowledge what we do have. You could, you could see a masterpiece of someone that's put a thousand little tile pieces into some type of portrait, but if one of them's missing, someone's going to point out that one thing that's missing. Right. And, and that's because they live in scarcity. So what I think is most important in, to use this in common language with, with the kids, but like I think the important message is society is designed for consumerism. And that, we, that when we like, this is the most intense conversation I have with my kids. I say, your phone is, is an extension of a corporate agenda trying to tell you what is required to make you happy. Now, obviously they're older when I have this conversation. And so I'm like, when we think that more equals better or happier, then we're in the trap. So the thing that I, I, I tell my kids is I, while you're under my roof, I'm here to make it like the amusement amusement park of life. You have to just try a lot of different things. You don't have to like all of them. You don't have to do all of them. I just want to help you find like, what is it that you really enjoy? What is it that you really love? And then I'm using gratitude as a fuel. And then I think the conversations is teaching them good questions. So, you know, as they get older, it's like, when they say, I don't have time or I can't afford it, those are the two common lies of the human condition. I don't have time and I can't afford it. So when I hear people say those things, I say, what if you just switch that to, do I value it enough? And if I do, what would it take to afford it? So one of the cool experiences I did with my kids is I donated a, a charitable thing and they let me go to um, Vancouver and drive from Vancouver to Whistler in this $750,000 Ferrari. So I brought the kids and, and like, I got to have these conversations with them because they're like, this is amazing. I want one of these. I'm like, cool. You could have one of these, but you know what it takes to actually add enough value in the world to get one of these things. I don't know if playing call of duty is going to get you there. I don't know if watching friends every night is going to make that happen for you. But at the same time, if you really start to figure out like, and I'm super proud of my 13 year old right now, he just started his first business. He's buying shoes um, as they drop these limited editions and he's passionate about it and he's studying it. And, you know, like we got a whole dissertation from him this morning over coffee about what shoes are coming out and, you know, how we could go about getting them. And now he's starting to learn delegation, getting his mom to sign up for these apps so that there's more chances. She's 
of all people teaching me about having bots that can help him. Corey could probably help him infinitely more than Carrie because my wife is the least technical person I know. I'm the second least, but I married someone I was just ahead of, so I could still impress her in a few ways. And, and so like, we've really encouraged some of these factors of, uh, you know, like what value is, where does it come from? What is a vision? What are they excited about? It's just these, these conversations. And the way to do this is to have like regular meetings, especially as they get a little bit older, where you can ask them questions where they're, they're expecting that meeting during that time that week. So they're not too distracted. And look, it just takes time. It just, you know, cause it's sometimes it's like herding cats. It's sometimes like, you know, trying to get a gnat to pay attention. But at the same time, we start to see this permeate because it's how we show up on a regular basis. So, um, and, and with young kids, I, you know, my favorite book that we ever read for our young kids was Love and Logic. I don't know if you know that methodology or system, but I think it, I think it teaches abundance in how you discipline and in how you give choice to your kids. So like, here's my early parenting methodology. Are you going to put on your clothes or am I have to, I, I'm going to have to yell at you. Like I, it was always do this or threat. Love and logic was, would you like to put on the right pant leg first or the left pant leg first? And you always give them choice, both of which you're very happy with. And I think because they have choice and you're actually giving them, you know, it, it kind of creates a more abundant thing because it's not yes or no, this or that, right or wrong. And, and, and so that's, that's kind of key. And then it talks about how to create some delayed gratification and even delayed consequence. So that was really instrumental doing the, what are you grateful for, you know, and whatever terms you might use with the three-year-old and then just having some time together uh, where, and, and then seeing how you operate. And, and talking to them, like love and logic was, hey, if you want your kids to brush your teeth, you, when they're little, you're like, oh, I'm brushing my teeth. It makes my teeth feel so good. I love brushing my teeth because then my breath doesn't stink and whatever. And then they're seeing you and you're, you're a narrator for their life. So when you're doing abundant things <laughs> and having abundance, acknowledge it, talk about it, express it. When you see evidence of abundance, talk about it, acknowledge it, express it, just be a narrator for your kid's life so that the inner dialogue starts to become one of abundance versus the news and social media that is one of negativity. What movie is this, mama? What See, movie? that just abundance of conversation right now. <laughs> it sounds so cute too, we like it. Never in lack of uh, yeah. conversation. Yeah. Great, no, that's great. Yes, thank you so much, appreciate that. Yep. Well, I think um, Randy's question is a good segue on, into um, the family um, retreat system that you do. So, Randy, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, in your book, the Rockefeller book, you talked about creating family retreats. And, you know, of, of course, I've heard of that, that concept and principle. But how? what's an easy way to implement that without making it too big so that people say, well, it's too much for me to implement? We talk about leaving a legacy, but... What is the how of doing that consistently? So the, the first aspects of doing that, like Corey and I have done this in our own relationship where we have this thing called Canadian cabin. He lives in Canada. I have a cabin in Utah. And we're like, this is now an annual thing. So it just started with come hang out. Like it was a, it was a simple invitation. And then we started to create little rituals and traditions inside of it. Now we always have this, we're going to improve one thing. So you know, we built a deck together, uh, a landing, we built, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. So it's like you start adding things as time goes on because people support that which they help to build. And if it's all your idea and what you want and it needs to go a certain way, A, you can start creating expectations that feel like pressure versus invitations. And B, because it, it has that, like people just kind of feel like an, it's an obligation versus uh, an opportunity. So if, it, it would be, what's something let, that you could start creating that's either a tradition that's out of the ordinary? Like in my family, our favorite tradition is the Christmas roast, which is we get together, everybody draws a name. And when I say draw a name, that's very loose, Randy. Whoever has the thing they want to tease someone about the most steals the name and says, I get Trisha this year, right? And so... And then we, we get together and then we, everybody gets to tease each other and it's the most epic experience. Now, 
We also in December got together and did an entire family retreat where we just hung out and talked the whole day. Now I had talking points. Hey, I want to, my main topic was we don't have to do things alone. We don't have to hold on burdens. You don't have to sit and worry. We can talk to each other about what we're concerned about. You think I'm a bad father. I'm not going to take total offense to it. If you just tell me what you're concerned about and we can do this as a family. And that day was December of last year was totally magical. And that tradition is something that we're doing on a regular basis. We also have our tradition of getting together on New Year's, having a little dance and karaoke party and a family showcase. So, so it, it's not like this overly formal start. It's a fun start that you checker in a little bit of things that you can start having more profound conversations with and that you can get other people's buy-in and ideas so that they actually feel like they're bringing it to you. So don't think of it as we need to get this family retreat done this year. Think of it as like, I have a five year window here where we want to start and get progress and then we can add more to it as time goes on. Yeah, and like Corey and I have Canadian cabin goals. They're some of the most ridiculous goals you could ever see. Like some are to catch fish, some are to do absolutely nothing for 24 hour period of time. You know, like it's just, but you get to invent it. You just get it invented. And that's, that's really, I think, a big, a big part of it. So, uh, so just what's going to compel people to get together? Perfect. Cool. Thanks. I, actually, it's to come to my comedy show. That's the best way. And then you come to the workshop with the family. We take care of everything at the workshop with the conversation. It's all good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kind of kidding. <laughs> Hey, Garrett, do you want to touch on um, how you and your family distilled the values that you um, decided to pass on and how you represented that in your family as, um, you know, the crest that you have above the fireplace uh, in your cabin? Yeah, we, we had this big sheet of paper that just had all these values listed on it. And, we, you know, and my kids were 9 and 11 at the time. And so Carrie, myself, and the kids, everyone got a circle three to seven values. Like if it was seven, that's fine. Just like what called to you. And if any, if any of the four of us all had the same value, it automatically became a family value. If there was values that two of us had, we would talk about that. And everyone got to talk about like, if you could only pick one of these values and, and think of values as like a, uh, something on a boat that you could only keep one, otherwise the boat sinks, what's the value you're going to fight for most? And then everybody got a chance to talk about this. Now, some of those values like became entertainment, like, but not being entertained, but entertaining others. Like, so, you know, uh, Roman likes to do it like I do with comedy. And so we actually created this little character that was an inside joke of the family that went on the crest because of that value. Vitality became one that we kind of gathered together based upon everyone wanted to be healthy, but what was the word that represented that? So. We, we just sat down and it didn't take as long as you would think because we were picking from a list and then we were having a conversation and we were asking the kids. And even at first, you know, my kids do this thing where I'll be like, hey, I ask questions all the time. Like, what's, what's one of your favorite movies? Yeah. And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, really? You don't know, like, just a movie that you like? So I just make it simpler, right? Not like, what's the one? I'm like, well, just tell me, what are things that you look for in other people? Like... We have, we have someone stealing the show because she's just adorable right there. Like that's a, you know, that's just awesome. She just, she's like posing into the camera and uh, it's awesome. So, but, but yeah, getting together and, and, and talking about that so that now everybody was part of the family crest. Everybody was part of the family values. And, and, you know, let's come back to bite you because uh, one day I was trying to steal the ball from Roman playing basketball, fell, hurt my elbow like an old man. And I wanted to go in and he goes, oh, Gunderson's finished what they start, which is start some of our family guidance. And so I hobbled through the rest of the game and he won, he won and then he came in and bragged for the rest of the day. And so he used, I was proud of him. He used leverage on the values that we had created. So, so it's something that, that could be a pretty simple exercise for your first family retreat is just have the list of values. Hey, what's important to us? Uh, you know. And look, we created a environment by having this cabin that everybody wants to go to that everybody wants to spend time at, that, you know, it's not too hard. And, and part of those traditions are we play games. Like there's a game called uh, Relative Insanity. 
And it's a Jeff Foxworthy game. It's kind of like Cards Against Humanity, but a toned down and relative. It's like making fun of relatives. So we actually use names of our different relatives in the game that makes us laugh hysterically and that we kind of play, or we play telestrations. So there's simple things like that that, that we add into this, but that goes be into what's our family values. It's, it's, hey, we enjoy these experiences together. And we want to be off technology for a time period. We like taking walks by the river. And, and so it's just something you build over time, progress over perfection, done is better than perfect, one step at a time. Don't look at what I've done because what I've done has been years in the making and it took forever to get that first step done. I knew I should do it for nine years. It wasn't, you know, or 11 years and finally got it done. And then it started to happen a lot easier and a lot faster and, and a lot more useful. And as a matter of fact, when we do the event, we have a segment that's super helpful on legacy. So, you know, I, I highly recommend that you guys check out the two day masterclass because it's, it's going to be, it, we've already tested some of it and the response was something we've never seen before because of the level of connection and emotion that came through that got beyond and transcended money. But I also took an event we had done over a hundred times and took the best of the three days and combined it into the one most impactful day. So we could have people work more on what's their vision? What are their obstacles? What do they need to heal with money? What are the, what is their money persona? And what is gonna help them achieve what they truly want and bridge the gap from where they are now to where they're gonna go? And where do we integ integrate in the very free flow nature of way? entertainment so it, it feels easy and short instead of long and frustrating want to master your money want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances click here and check out more videos like this on money matters